All right. So today's lecture will be on graphic and product design. So we're going to talk this week about how to visually design your application. And um, to start, we're just going to go way back in history, and I'll tell you a little bit about where graphic and product design came from, and then we'll approach user interface design. Um, topics we'll discuss today, and some of these may bleed into Wednesday, are brief history of graphic and product design, um, what simplicity and elegance mean in user interface design, some notes on color, how to pick color, gestalt principles of perception, typography, and then arrangement and composition. So graphic design, one of its major functions is that it's about communication. So for example, if you've been to a national park, you usually get one of those uh, fold-out brochures that are you know, very nicely laid out, but that have the ultimate goal of teaching you something about that site. Right? And so text and images are combined with the goal of communicating that information as effectively as possible. But graphic design also has another side, and that is interpretation. So the text, the content, um, has some meaning. And so one question is, how do we interpret and give form to that meaning through graphical means? So just to uh, show you this contrast, the poster on your left from the 1940s is for what? Anyone have a guess? Yeah, it's for a car race, exactly. So it's for a car race in Monza in Italy. So you get that notion of you know, high velocity and cars going around in circles um, through, through the arrows. And the poster on the right is from the mid to late 60s San Francisco, Haight-Ashbury, height of you know, counterculture movement. Um, it's a concert poster for the Fillmore Auditorium. And so these look very different because the two posters are for very different events. Right? And so part of graphic design is to interpret what that meaning is and to give it visual form. But let's step back in history. You could argue that graphic design starts here. This is the Gutenberg Bible. So the first mass-produced uh, printed book. And if you look in detail, one thing that's really interesting here is um, this alphabet was directly inspired from black letter handwriting. And you wrote black letter with a pen with a broad nib. And so you have these diagonal, thick and thin parts that just emulate how you would have written and lettered with that kind of pen. And here, actually, so while this was mass produced, all of these initial letters um, in color, we're still hand drawn in after the fact. Right. Does anyone know where the name uppercase and lowercase comes from? Yes. Yeah, when they were um, in like early printing presses, they had cases of all the metal letters, and um, they were organized by like frequency of use of upper and lower cases. Yeah. So we have. We're printing type now, right? How is that done? Well, with metal slugs that you align into lines. And yes, printers had cases of these letters to assemble the lines. And they were organized into an uppercase and a lowercase. And just as you said, the, the size of these, um, of the subcompartment in those cases were then uh, sized by frequency of the letters. So lowercase e, the most uh, frequent letter in written English. That's why it gets the, the biggest compartment. All right, but through, you know, from the late Middle Ages, the, the Renaissance, um, graphic design was mostly restricted, well, through these printed books and pamphlets that were mostly restricted to really elevated subjects, like, um, you know, proclamations from the church or plays. Um, or, or books. And that all changed with the Industrial Revolution and the 19th century. 
when advertising really came about. So lots of people had more disposable incomes, lots of people, other people tried to sell them things, whether it was the circus coming to town or an excursion or other products. And so you got this explosion in very different lettering styles and combinations of text and images um, on the page. And so it was really kind of the Wild West of, or the Cambrian explosion of graphic design um, until the early 20th century when modernism came about and radically went against the ornamentation and mixing of many different styles and tried to reduce graphic design to the essential minimal elements. So the lettering and the original design of the London Underground is one of the prototypical examples of early modern design. Uh, the biggest influence on 20th century design probably came though, out of Germany, uh, the Bauhaus School, which was there from 1919 through 33. And actually, lots of the people who were founding faculty members at the Bauhaus then emigrated to the United States uh, with the outbreak of, well, Nazis coming to power and then the outbreak of World War II. And so things like the Chicago School of Architecture and Design in California were very much in influenced um, by designers leaving from the Bauhaus and coming to, to the US. So here's what some of their design looked like in the uh, 1920s. Um, on the left, uh, Josef Schmidt's poster has, it has a Russian constructivist feel to it where the design becomes very much like architecture. Um, on the right, though, uh, the Herbert Beyer, this is an invitation to Kandinsky's 60th, um, 60th birthday. Um, what I want to point out here is how they manipulate font size and weight to lead your eye through the scene. So what's the most important part about this flyer? It's Kandinsky. He's famous. <laughs> And then what's the second most important part? Well, it's an exhibition. And then, so you move down the hierarchy from what do I want to know first to, OK, I want to go to this. If I've already bought in, then I can find the details of where it actually is and how I get there somewhere small in the corner. So uh, that's kind of a very powerful idea that we apply through today to, to use visual emphasis <coughs> to mirror the importance of the content. Uh, something else that happened in the 1920s was a radical rethinking of you, how you arrange text. So this is kind of a standard um, model of alignment that uh, you found in the printed books from the Middle Ages and in certificates where there's a single axis of alignment that just goes through the middle and you center align everything. And Chichel argued that actually you, know, you get a much more dynamic and appropriate layout if you're asymmetric. You have different lines of alignment, and you left and right align different parts of your design to those lines. This was basically the prototype for grid-based design, which you then see going all through the second half of the 20th century. Here, the grid is very um, explicit. Right, it's just drawn underneath. And just the idea of aligning all of your content to an underlying grid were the most powerful um, ideas in, in layout. Now, the major change that happened afterwards is from all of the designs we've seen were basically one-offs. Right? I make a poster, a flyer, a book. And with the rise of larger corporations, what became really important was some consistency across different types of products or um, marketing collateral that a company produced. So Paul Rand was a really influential designer um, in uh, working in the 1950s and later. And he did the initial design for IBM. And that was really the movement from single one-off design to system design. So he designed a system, a set of design rules that IBM would apply to whatever new product they would produce, whether it was shrink-wrapped software or whether it was like a marketing memo. It described, here's, 
here are the fundamental elements, and here's how you combine them in any given situation. So there are many, many different forms of content. And this basically carries directly through to web design or mobile application design. Right? Because oftentimes, take a news website, the content will change every day, maybe every hour. But it's, it's the idea that you set up a set of styles of design rules and then just pour that content in to those rules um, that we take over from, from this early corporate design. And then the mid-1990s happened, and that was kind of a total aberration. <laughs> Basically what happened was people got really powerful design tools, but they weren't yet thinking at a large scale in terms of system design. So uh, Raygun Magazine from the 1990s is a perfect example. David Parson was the designer who really epitomized this, where type did all kinds of weird and bizarre things. It was really the interpretive dance of, uh, of graphic design. And that then also disappeared rather rapidly, because most of the design we now do is system design. And these are all one-offs that were manually laid out with digital tools. All right, so that's what graphic design did. Uh, let's quickly look at product design. So product design has both aspects of form and function. There's a function to graphic design as well, right? It's communicating meaning. But here, a product also has to do something. So there's form. Good design should be a pleasure to use. But also function, you have to support the user's tasks. And if we unwind and um, <coughs> go back in time, really, product design started once again with the Industrial Revolution, where before you had artisans making one-offs and improving them over time with every new piece of furniture they made. Now, once we had mass production, um, Design came into its own as a, as a discipline. Now, early machines looked kind of like this uh, mimeograph. So what does a mimeograph do? That's an early copy machine. Um, or, you know, this chain drill or A Manson tricycle. Um, basically, early design was categorized, uh, was often characterized by the fact that it was so hard to make mass manufacturing work. And so, early products mainly were sold by look what you can now do. You can now copy something. But all of the workings of the machine, all of the levers and everything else, were kind of exposed to you. So if you go into a machine shop these days and you walk in front of like a Bridgeport 1950s mill, you still see that. It's just an intimidating machine with all kinds of levers and dials everywhere. And it's very hard to interpret what you're supposed to do with it. And so once again, getting away from that, the Bauhaus was very um, influential in getting stripping products back down to they're really fundamental elements. So you get these really early minimalist uh, furniture that is still selling well uh, today. Um, in the US, one of the pioneers was Raymond Lowy. And he introduced the idea of streamlining. So the automobile early on, you know, everything was exposed out in the open. Same with the telephone, or the clock, or the chair, lots of ornamentation. And he said, well, really, you want to simplify from the point of view of the user. And so the forms become simpler. And also, there are things like wind resistance that become more tear shaped. So the st standard example is, you know, before Louis took over design for the Pennsylvania Railroad, locomotives looked like this. Afterwards, they started looking like this. So there's a powerful element of, um, of this idea, which is you know, high unnecessary complexity from the user. However, there's also a downside. 
in that the forms proved to be very seductive, so lots of stuff became streamlined. And you end up with a streamlined pencil sharpener, which doesn't move at all, right? It's like bolted to a desk. So the streamlining of the form no longer makes sense for this particular object. And so um, this is where Louis Sullivan's uh, famous quote comes in that form should follow function. So you shouldn't streamline just for the hell of it because you can, but when it makes sense for your type of product. And clearly it makes sense for um, automobiles and for trains, things that move through space quickly. And there are probably other minimal forms that are more appropriate for other types of products. Um, the other really important uh, field that early industrial design in the US pioneered were human factors. So Henry Dreyfus, one of the other pioneers, just took measurements of lots of different people, male, female, children, and established ranges for um, how tall are people. You know, what's the size of their hand? What angle can we comfortably hold? How big can, um, for example, a rod be that we can, so we can still grip it? And he just assembled all of these tables to make the job for industrial designers easier so they could ref refer <coughs> to this data in the design of physical products. And so in a way, this is you know, the physical product design uh, predecessor to the model human processor. <coughs> and so one of the uh, really famous designs that he did uh, that was informed by this was the Model 500 telephone. So does anyone in this room still use a rotary telephone or at least seen one of those? Later on, this was replaced with push button, right? But the design of um, of the earpiece was actually very much informed by the average shape of a human face. So the angle and how far it extends. And that is uh, one of the reasons why it's actually with a landline, older landline telephone, you may get clearer audio than if you call someone from a cell phone. Because with a cell phone, we've optimized for pocketability. But the microphone is actually now much further away uh, from your mouth. Form follows function can also be uh, driven to excess. So if you've ever seen the, who's seen the Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris? A couple of people. It's smack in the middle of Paris. Um, this is what it looks like. And it had this really, really radical design idea that said, we're just going to show all of the function of this building on the outside. So. The escalators are bolted to the outside. The HVAC pipes all run on, on the outside. Um, so it's a very strong statement. It just turns out to be a completely terrible idea. Um, because you now have a really, really complicated outside surface that's basically impossible to keep clean. All right, so if we don't want that, then um, what should we strive for? Well. Simplicity and elegance are two uh, worthwhile topics to target. And as Picasso said, good artists borrow, great artists steal. So learning about how to do good, simple, elegant design, um, I can tell you a little bit about the rules, but most of it will come through practice and from gathering examples and thinking through why a particular example works or not. So I can give you a couple rules of thumb, but they're hard to you know, internalize in the abstract. Um, but does anyone know where Picasso stole from? So this is from, I don't know if this is from the Demoiselle d'Avignon or one of the other paintings from that period, you know, early cubism that's really associated with Picasso that just burst onto the Western European art scene as this completely alien new style. But it was not really new. 
So it turns out right around the same time, um, natural history museums, this was co the colonial period, right, would show exhibitions of all the artifacts collected in their colonies abroad. And so if you look at African tribal masks, you see the same simplification into angular surfaces. And you can put some of them side by side, and it's very at least suggestive that that is where Picasso got his inspiration for his painting stuff from. All right, so let's talk about simplicity. Um, so minimal designs are often, not always, the most effective. And what are some of the ingredients? Well, one is reduction. That is, you want to strip down ornamentation, only leave essential elements that are necessary for something doing its intended function. Part of uh, reduction is also regularization. So be consistent. Make the same design decisions over and over again for different aspects of your design. And you can and also try whenever you can have one element perform multiple roles, do that. So uh, one example is the scroll bar, which actually does two things at once, right? It gives you a handle to move the document around, but it also shows you where you are in the document and how much of the document you are seeing by its length. Some benefits of minimum Minimal design are that minimal design is approachable. It's really easy and quick to understand. There's an absence of competing elements, and that makes us more, that invites further exploration, invites us in. Uh, related to that is it's easy to figure out if there are only a few elements. So on the Polaroid, there's exactly one big red button. Right, versus a profusion of different dials on a manual uh, SLR camera. Another benefit is immediacy. So you're drawn into the important visual elements if that's all that is left. Um, one way to get to minimal design is through refinement. So think about what to leave out. So here's a geographic version of the London subway that accurately represents where the stations are on a map. This is not what you see, though. What you see is this version, which has all of the um, geographical relationships distorted in order to make it easier to read. So prefer straight lines that just indicate roughly the direction. Is it in the same direction? Is it to the north, to the south? All right, let me give, give you some examples um, of how some of these rules are violated often in user interfaces. So this is Smart Draw Professional. And this is an example from you reading some personal information manager. It's just clutter and noise. Where do you start? What's the organization? It's not clear. There's just way too much going on. So here, there's interference. And we're presenting two different pieces of information, like the name of a menu item and the shortcut to get to it, right next to each other, both in text. It makes it harder. It interferes with a reading of just the most important element, which is the text. Usually, only experts get to the keyboard shortcuts. Um, too much structure can interfere with our reading as well. So if we have boxes within boxes within boxes within boxes, right, there's a lot of visual structure that gets in the way of our interpretation. And so having a simpler visual structure where you don't just use you know, lines to group, but also white space, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, how to do that effectively, um, makes it easier for us to make sense of the overall structure of an interface. 
Here's another version of Microsoft Bob from a different company. Taking your metaphors too literal. Uh, we've talked about that in the past. Um, another frequent mistake is just gratuitous use of 3D when it doesn't add any additional information. It just adds pixel noise. So this year could have been represented just as a 2D line graph. <coughs> and I have no idea why one would think of a toolbar as a you know, column that you rotate. Other things we, we tend to see is just over-reliance on Chrome. So all of the UI that goes around the content. Right, so in Windows Media Player, we have like one, two, three, three different bars plus the menu. Um, and then they, can't, they are also very wide. They actually don't give you, they don't give you larger targets in terms of Pitt's Law. There's just lots of space wasted. All right. Um, let's talk for a minute about color. So, because as I mentioned, we have um, at least in uh, in the rods, we have uh, three different types of rods that have three different um, response profiles to so different wavelengths of light inside a retina. Um, that means we need at least a three-dimensional color space, and so. Common ones um, that you may see are RGB versus CMYK. Now, the major difference about you know, the guideline for you helping you think about when you are in which is actually is about the technology that um, that you're using. So, you're in additive color space when your display is emitting photons. So. If the display is off, you're black. And as you add more light energy, right, you get brighter. And so the uh, fundamental colors we work with are red, green, and blue that, when all added together, add up to white. Now, if you, for example, are in print land or in, I guess, in e-ink as well, once we get to e-ink color displays, you're reflecting and absorbing light of different wavelengths. Right? So the more light you absorb, the darker it gets. So when you mix colors on a printed page, you go from white to black. And so here our uh, fundamental components are cyan, magenta, and yellow. Uh, it turns out in the, pr in the printers that you usually buy, um, adding cyan, magenta, and yellow usually adds up to a not so nice dark brown. And that's why there's usually a fourth color that just lets you uh, print richer blacks. Now, who's ever designed with web-safe colors? All right, so there's a small number of so-called web-safe RGB uh, combinations. So combinations of red, green, and blue um, expressed as hexadecimal triplets, right? Zeros. You can use zeros, threes, sixes, nines, et cetera. Um, and one of the pitfalls that I often see in designing with color is that you think about color in the wrong representation. So you think about them, about that looks like a nice hex string. Should make a nice color as well. Right? If you actually look, though, at the web safe colors, you get this lime green and hot pink and just colors that are not very versatile at all. And so one of the things to realize here is that values here and distances in this RGB space don't actually correspond to our perception of how we perceive color. And so it's very hard to make any, have any intuition about moving around in RGB space. Now, there are other color spaces that are um, perceptually organized, and that make more sense to us. And so uh, some of them basically um, are different variations on three different dimensions. There's hue or colorfulness. Which color is it? Is it white versus, uh, sorry, is it green versus yellow versus blue versus red? 
So Q is around here. Then lightness is from white to black. And then colorfulness is saturation, right? Are you gray with a hint of green, or are you very intensely green? And so those three dimensions actually make sense for us to reason about. Let's say, I like the lightness of this, but it should be greener rather than red. Or um, we have, you know, this is green, but not green enough, so make it more colorful. And if you work in Photoshop or other, any other graphics editor, you can usually switch in one, to one of these perceptual spaces. Um, there is actually one space that is purely based on um, perceptual experiments, which is the Munsell color space, which is based on experiments of just noticeable differences between colors. So you can imagine making lots and lots of pairwise comparisons between different color swatches and using those to find equal distances. And so you can look up uh, the Munsell color space. You can buy these wheels, or there's also a software that lets you explore. And the idea here is that the difference between one swatch to the next is roughly constant anywhere in the space. All right, well, these are abstract models, but how do you actually pick colors for your interface? So a couple of general strategies. Uh, use a limited palette, so restrict yourself. Um, so Java Look and Feel, for example, has like six different shades. Um, oftentimes, designers will adopt a palette that really only has three or four different colors, and then maybe tints. So you pick your three or four colors, and then make them uh, lighter and darker or more or less saturated. Don't rely on fully saturated colors. You'll make your UI look like we were back in the 80s. Um, and color contrast is especially important when you're looking at text. And one of the tests you can employ is a squint test. So squint your eyes until everything goes really you know, hazy. And at that point, these two colors basically blend into each other, which tells you just have poor contrast. So even when squinting, you should have strong separation of uh, text color from its background. Now, that's still somewhat vague. So here's another strategy. Let someone else pick colors for you. So if you go to um, a bookstore, you'll find you know, in the art section a whole shelf full of color books where people just go through different color combinations, pick them out, and then show you example designs of what something would look like in a color combination. And oftentimes, they're very characteristic combinations um, because color trends follow fashion. So certainly in clothing, we see certain colors coming in and out of fashion every year. But the same is true for user interfaces and graphical design in general. So these somewhat pale colors, for example, very much say like 1950s. And so people have you know, looked through lots of historical designs and then come up with a palette. So if you want a retro design, you can just reference um, those combinations and pick one out. Now, there are also um, sites online, such as uh, Cooler from Adobe or Color Brewer, which helps you think through, if you want to do data visualization, it helps you think through, well, what type of data do I have? We'll talk about that on Wednesday. And then what type of color scales um, are appropriate for that type of data? All right, last thing to talk about for today are uh, Gestalt principles. Uh, so Gestalt is a, it's a German term, means like a unified whole. And um, the Gestalt principles come out of visual perception experiments um, in the 1920s, uh, mostly in Germany, hence the name. And basically, these uh, psychologists wanted to come up with principles of how we make sense of scenes. How do we group disparate elements into sensible holes and, and groups. And so there's a whole list of these principles. I just wanted to um, step you through these. So 
Figure and ground is about you know, how we perceive something as either being an object or being part of the background. The principle of surroundedness says that when something is surrounded by, completely surrounded by other color, we tend to see that object as the foreground. The principle of relative size says, well, if something is smaller than something else, we tend to see the smaller thing as the object and the larger area as the background. Now, in this very well-known, um, not illusion, but um, illustration of the principle, it's actually ambiguous, right? So you can see this as either a vase or as spaces, depending. And you can probably convince yourself uh, of going back and forth from either interpretation. And so if we were to apply the principle of size, then if we make the element in the middle smaller, then they should look more like vases. Right? And if we pull the two elements further apart, we should relatively see more, fa interpret this more likely as faces um, so, figure, um, oftentimes actually interesting graphical design plays with this relationship of, of figure and ground. Um, here's some, here's a, uh, the next law is proximity, and the law of proximity simply says things that are near each other tend to be grouped together. So that, that's why we see this here as columns of dots, and the lower design as rows of dots. All we really changed, it's the same number of dots, same size, we just changed what's the distances between horizontal and vertical elements. Um, the principle of proximity also comes into uh, play when we try to interpret data. So if we had the scatter plot, let's say from an experiment that we ran, right, we'd visually probably associate point X with group A rather than with group B, just because it's closer. Now, how do you use this in design? Well, let's take a simple menu. How would we use proximity the principle of proximity to improve the design of this dinner menu. Someone already said it. Yeah, just what belongs together, keep those things together, and between things that don't belong together, just insert space. Right? So it makes it, that already makes it much clearer of what the title and what the different dishes are. Now, a second principle, uh, or an additional principle, is similarity, which, is, which just says that features which look similar are associated, and we tend to group elements that have the same features together. So now the spacing is exactly equal, but we still see rows or columns because of the different graphical attributes. So if we wanted to apply this to our menu, you may think about making you know, the, names, the main names of the dishes, treating them all the same, um, and making the title really dissimilar from how the dishes are treated, so that the, the title is not interpreted as belonging to the same group as the dishes. All right, other principles are symmetry, so bilateral symmetry, which we see very frequently in nature, right, in us, in animals, in plants, um, therefore gives us a strong sense of a figure. Here we may just see a couple of scribbles, but as soon as we have um, axial symmetry vertically, we now see these as two figures. 
Now, connectedness, we just draw connections between different elements, tends to override these other um, components, these other laws. All right. The law of continuity uh, says that smooth continuity is preferred to abrupt changes of direction. And that means that this figure we're more likely to interpret as a squiggly line over a rectangle rather than these, these two figures. It also means that if you have like, node link diagrams, that it is easier to follow connectivity if you have smooth contours, smooth links between them, rather than Manhattan routing with right angles. Because it's hard for us to follow the continuity of a single line when you have have abrupt changes of direction. Well, can you say apply to like uh, apps where we saw with both Bart and uh, the one you came back around, they were all connected to one? Is there something else going on there? Well, one thing you see actually in most of those lines is um, that angles usually only change by 45 degrees. Right? So you don't usually have right angles on, on the subway maps. And that helps with continuity. So there's a trade-off between continuity and, um, and simplicity, right? And just making, having a minimal set of different design elements, such as 0, 45, or 90 degree, degree aligned lines. Closure means uh, interpretations which produce closed rather than open figures are preferred over interpretations that yield open figures. So we see this as a circle behind a rectangle rather than a 270 degree arc next to a rectangle. Um, and closure also means that we get these illusory contours where there is no rectangle in two of the three um, elements at the bottom, but we still see it. Right? Because it makes more sense for us to interpret where do these cutouts come from? Well, if you follow the line, you see a shape emerge. And then um, the last rule is common fate, which means that things that move together we interpret as belonging to the same group. All right, we'll talk more about how um, Gestalt principles influence UI design on Wednesday. But for now, uh, don't forget to do your reading. Do it by Wednesday, but you can answer the question by Friday. And now, um, if uh, Kate and Neha, you could come to the front, we're going to return the midterms. We're going to have this, this, these uh, six groups, and each of us is going to take two of the groups. So we'll have A through D and E through J here, uh, K through L and M through R in the middle, and S through W and X through Z on the left. And we'll just call out names and... <laughs> Last names. All right. S through Z over here. David Sito. Timothy Moon. From Canada. I've never seen a Kimberly. Yeah, it's like their national pride. So I told him, like, if there's ever a John Slum. Glenn. Haoshan <laughs> Wang. Uh, 